Hey everybody, this is Russ Altman from The Future of Everything. You know, we have 200 episodes in our archives, and today we're going to play one from 2022. I spoke to Professor Srabanti Chowdhury, a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford University, about semiconductors. You know, Srabanti does work in new materials to make semiconductors, which are key for all computer chips and all electronics, She's trying to make them smaller, faster, more powerful, and very importantly, more energy efficient. Innovation is key as electronics continue to explode in our society and the applications seem endless. In this episode, Srabanti tells us about some of the new materials she's experimenting with and how that impacts the future of semiconductors. We thought this was a particularly good episode to replay because recently the Chips and Science Act was passed by the U.S. Congress allocating more than $280 billion over 10 years to semiconductor research. We really hope you enjoy this replay. Before we jump into this podcast, let me ask you to please rate and review it. It helps us improve and it helps spread the word about the future of everything. A semiconductor material is extremely useful because it can be engineered to control the flow of electricity. It can allow it to pass in some circumstances and in other circumstances it can stop it or slow it from passing. Very useful for electronics. This ability to behave differently in a controllable way is in contrast to many other materials that either allow electricity to pass freely, like a copper wire or a salt water, or don't let electricity to pass at all, like ceramic or glass or air. So semiconductors are used to create transistors and many other basic elements of electronic circuits that run our computers, our cell phones, communication networks, pretty much anything you plug in or runs on a battery. What's the most famous semiconductor material? Well, it's silicon. With the discovery of how to manipulate silicon in the 50s and, and, and around that era, electronics arrived. Now, these discoveries happened at AT&T Bell Labs, uh, for the most part, in New Jersey, but the center of the industry moved to a region south of San Francisco in the Santa Clara Valley, which became known as Silicon Valley. And that's actually where we're sitting uh, right now. At least that's where I'm sitting. Now, silicon has been a key element uh, in semiconductors for 50 years, but we are starting to run up against some physical limitations in its ability to support electronics. So there's a big push to identify new elements or, and take advantage of them to provide the next generation of electronics, like phones with 5G, 6G, 7G, uh, faster computers, more efficient computers. Shrabanti Chowdhury is a professor of electrical engineering and a fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University. Shrabanti, one of the promising semiconductors is gallium nitride, which I know you work on. What are the advantages of this and other new materials over silicon? Thanks, Russ. That was a great introduction um, about semiconductors, as well as, you know, uh, I, I really am excited about this opportunity to, to talk about these materials beyond silicon. And as you correctly said, gallium nitride is one of the most promising ones. So the idea is, as you said, you know, in semiconductors, you can control semiconductors to conduct. Sometimes you want to want them to conduct like a conductor or a metal. Sometimes you want them to stop the flow of electrons or electricity. Uh, and the thing is, um, it, when we talk about silicon, we, there are a couple of things that we uh, relate with a semiconductor, such as how much voltage it can block, right? This is when you're talking about an off, a semiconductor in an offset, off state. And I'll introduce a word called switch, okay, early on. So if you think about a switch, which when you turn it on, it conducts, and when you turn it off, it doesn't. Yeah. Now think about that switch made out of a semiconductor, such as which is our very well-known silicon. Uh, now, when you are looking into silicon, there are certain limitations where how much voltage it can block, okay? And even more importantly, with how little of the semiconductor it can block that voltage, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about silicon reaching a plateau or, uh, you know, a limit, um, we are basically talking about, can we make this switches more power dense? Or in other words, can we pack more power 
per unit volume of the semiconductor. I, I didn't realize this. So what you're saying is that you can have a switch made out of silicon that if you could put a big enough electronic voltage across it, it may jump over what's supposed to be a, a, a closed switch. And of course that would limit what you can do if you, because you have to keep the electrical vol voltages now lower than you might want them for some reason. Right, right. The, the, the way to look at it, I mean, I very much like the mechanical switch that you use to turn on and off your, you know, of your, let's say, uh, the, the light in your, uh, in your room and things like that. So when it is off, right, it is not conducting. So it's not letting any electricity or current pass. So it has to, in a, in a switch, uh, which as, a, as we were just discussing, in that off state, you have to be, your conduction should go down to zero. And that okay. happens when the voltage across the semiconductor switch is very high. Okay, mm -hmm. and then when you switch it on, uh, you drop, you, you want almost like a, 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 an instantaneous rise in the current, yes. or in other words, you want very low resistive loss. Okay, any resistance accounts to loss. So uh, kind of connecting back to the question you asked, like what, what is, why is gallium nitride is so special? So basically it has, a, it allows a lot more power dense solution, okay? Um, like if you look at the trend in power electronics or any electronics, you know, RF electronics, like the radio frequency electronics or computational electronics, the name of the game is how power dense the solution can be. Mm -hmm. Because we want more of it within a very small chip size. Uh, we want compact solutions and so on and so forth. So gallium nitride allows things to be more efficient, okay? Um, and I, I like to think even um, in, a, in another terms, like how less lossy the solution is. You know, efficiency is a great, uh, um, you know, concept, but sometimes it doesn't strike us what is 99% or 98% right, right. efficient. But if you think in terms of loss, then you understand that, okay, if I build a system and if I can reduce the loss from, let's say, 100 watts down to one watt, that's a very big thing, right? So, so gallium nitride allows us to do just that. And it just, it helps us to uh, find out solutions which are power dense. So therefore you can fit a lot of these transistors as you very nicely alluded to in the first part in a very small chip area. And, and the whole thing actually makes a much more efficient or a low loss solution. Um, Great, great. So yeah, so that's easy for all of us to understand because that means our cell phones get smaller, our monitors get brighter, our computers are more powerful per, per cubic foot. Um, now I know that there are other materials. So gallium nitride, I know people won Nobel prizes ab about it and um, you, you can read about it. It, it's, it seems like it's a, a very valuable material, but I know that you've also worked with diamond and I have to ask about that because I I love, I love diamonds. And so <laughs> I just wanted to ask you. So I would have guessed that diamonds were more like glass, that you were not going to pass a current through diamonds, but I might have guessed wrong. So can you tell me a little bit about diamonds in this context? Thank you for that question. And I love diamond too. <laughs> <laughs> Besides being a very shiny stone, it does, does a lot of good stuff. And you're right. It is what we call a insulator, or uh, uh, as you mentioned, the glass is an example, diamond is an insulator. Um, however, diamond is a semiconductor if you can uh, dope it. That means whenever, as we said, um, semiconductors, uh, you can control or you can modulate, a uh, little more technical term, the current that passes through this material. Now, that happens because of one very important thing, which is, which is called doping, or in other words, we uh, introduce impurities in a semiconducting material and make it conducting when we want it to. So diamond is a very wide band gap semiconductor. How wide it is? It is roughly, you can think two times wider than uh, gallium nitride and how so, wide- So when you talk about this word of wideness, can yeah. you give, give me a feel for what, I, what you mean by a wide right. or a narrow gap? Yeah, that's a very good point question. So, uh, if I if I try to answer this in a more technical term, I would use two two terms here. One is conduction band and valence band. Okay, the distance in energy between these two bands re is referred as band gap. The way to look at it is, let's say, if you want to make an electron conducting in a semiconductor, 
you need to supply a certain amount of energy. And that is roughly equal, uh, equal to this band gap that I'm talking about. So if you supply an electron with roughly the band gap amount of energy, you can upgrade it to the conduction valley, valley and therefore you can make it conducting, okay? So therefore, if you take silicon, you know, which is sort of our baseline, roughly the band gap is 1.1 electron volt. So you can think about it as a reference. And let's okay. say with respect to silicon, gallium nitride has three times that of the band gap. That means you will need actually more energy to upgrade or uplift this electron to make it conducting. Now, gotcha. if you take diamond, it's almost six times more energy is required. So okay. as you require more and more energy to, uh, to make these electrons conducting, uh, we call it wider and wider band gap. So coming to your question, so diamond is very attractive because first of all, it's a single element semiconductor. What is single element? It's made out of carbon, just like we all are. So uh, that makes it fascinating to study uh, the physics uh, in it. And also in terms of the um, you know, technology and engineering, uh, diamond can be doped. So you can actually in introduce this impurities which did not happen for a very long time. I mean, we, we were all aware of diamond from periodic table from like long back, maybe from right. many leaves time. But, uh, you know, we didn't know how to dope it to make it into a semiconductor, but now we know how to dope it. Once we know how to dope it, then suddenly we can find out um, all these exciting things that is possible. And in, in case of diamond, just to give you a perspective, um, it can hold 20 megavolts per centimeter. Okay, so if you have a centimeter thick of whoa, whoa. diamond, you can carry 20 megavolts. I mean, 20 megavolts is still debatable because this materials are so new. We don't know how, these are theoretical predictions. We will understand only with time how much of this can be unlocked or unleashed. Uh, but that's a, that's a lot of voltage. In other words, yes. in a micron of a semiconductor, you can hold 2000 volts, right? Uh, whereas in case of um, uh, silicon, for example, that is like 30 volts in one micron. So if you hold 30 volts in one micron, take silicon, you can, you can think about the picture, you can hold almost 2000 volts in the same amount of the material if you're working with a diamond switch, for instance. So, so that, that sounds absolutely amazing because uh, any word that has any a word with the, with the prefix mega is gonna get people's attention, of course. <laughs> So, so, but let me, uh, just to check one thing. So you said that these uh, new materials are gonna help with efficiency, and yet you're talking about higher powers. So is it the case that they're holding these higher powers, but when they release them or when they allow them to flow, they're dissipating less energy and they're losing less energy so that the net efficiency is much higher, even though you're dealing with much bigger numbers in terms of the absolute energy that, that's being used? That is That is absolutely correct. So there are two, properties which makes a good switch. And again, let's get back to our mechanical switch example. Uh, when you're switching it off, you're absolutely disconnecting the, uh, the circuit or you're breaking the continuity of the circuit. So that's very ideal actually, you know, <laughs> even though it's just sticking on the wall, we don't really, this is a very ideal switch to, uh, uh, to say the least. Now in the semiconductor, um, things are not that uh, digital, or in other words, it's not one and zero sort of a thing. So you always, whenever you are in the off state of the switch or you are not conducting mode, you are slowly leaking current. Yeah. current okay. okay. And the wider the semiconductor is, the smaller the leakage would be. So that means when the switch is off, if you have no current flowing, then there is no loss. I mean, typically this loss is manifested in terms of heat. Okay, we call it joule heat. Okay. And that is basically the current dictates how much of this loss um, will be, the, how, how much loss will the switch incur. And if you can reduce this off state current, you will actually make it very, uh, very efficient switch. So that is how this wide band gap materials make very efficient. But the other thing that I said, that another thing is very important in the on state. So this mm -hmm. is all a good thing about off state, but in the on state also, when you're conducting, when you're having a high current, it will give you this joule heat loss, okay? Or the conduction loss, I should say. Um, now, these materials have another very good property. They have very high electron mobility. What is mobility? 
let's think about is the velocity of an electron, okay? So electrons move very fast in these materials. So based on these two properties, which a diamond-like semiconductor or gallium nitride semiconductor hosts, we can make very efficient switches. Okay, that's really helpful. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Shrabanti Chowdhury. We're talking about semiconductors and the new materials. So you've kind of actually beautifully made it clear where the benefits of the, of the gallium and maybe the doped diamonds. This is the first time I've heard the word doping in a positive. <laughs> in a positive. Um, but it all can't be that easy because you're a professor who's working on this actively. So what are the challenges to, in the research that need to be overcome so that I can get my faster computers and my better Wi-Fi and all of the, we'll talk about the applications later, but what are the big questions that need to be uh, solved? Yeah, um, and that's where all our you know efforts are going into. So the first and foremost um, part of any semiconductor in, uh, engineering is trying to make sure this can be manufactured. Okay, I mean even though we do a lot of our physics and other exciting science in our labs, ultimately if you go to an industry guy, he would ask me how much it costs and does it. Uh, you know, provoke me to change my current solution to this new solution. So the right. cost is kind, kind of, you know, behind all of this. And for those reasons, but, but in order to address the cost, we need to get very high performance. So I like the metric called performance over cost rather than cost alone, because ultimately, you know, we pay a lot more money to get a uh, more functional gadget, for instance, right? So we like functions and functions is sort of derived from more performance. Okay, right. so to come back to your question, the challenges, some of the challenges that we need to solve are how are this manufacturable, okay? And this, there's a lot of industry academia relationship that are being fostered currently, which helps us to address this. But in our lab, there are a lot of rich physics. I mean, semiconductor and uh, semiconductors is a lot about physics, a lot of it about engineering. And the beautiful thing is here we can apply the physics and we can see whether it works or not very yeah. quickly. So, so some of the challenges that we are solving right now is how, when I was describing how low, how less of a loss we can incur in, while during the switching operation, which depends on how high we can dope the semiconductor in right. the good sense, okay? And that's one thing, without altering its, you know, physical properties and things like that. Um, and also very, very important, can it be scaled, right? I mean, when you talk about a semiconductor, we are talking about eight inches, 10 inches diameter of wafers, right? So that, that means that the physics should apply not only to a very little coupon kind of a uh, you know, uh, wafer size, but can it be translated into a more scalable solution? So those are the kind of things we are looking into. Um, so we, we really care about making this useful. And that's why we really want to focus on uh, finding solutions that can reduce the cost. And believe it or not, it starts with the lab, like simple uh, experiments. I'll give you an example. In semiconductors, we often use gold-based contact, okay? And Diamonds and gold, this is the best field Can ever. Can you believe it? Yeah, so so gold we use, um, you know, by the way, I will make one comment. The diamond that we talk about is a very cheap diamond. I mean, oh. it's called a synthetic diamond. It, it, right. it, it has a lot of other applications, including jewel industries actually are looking into synthetic diamond as you would know, but back to the gold topic, you know, gold is a very common contact metal, you know, but when we were looking into this power electronics, the first thing we wanted to do was, can we get rid of gold because it increases the cost? So, but now it's, it sounds simple, but the physics can completely change if you change the metallurgy rate. Right. So what I'm trying to get at is the ultimate impact of semiconductors, um, which is in manufacturability or scalability, reducing costs, but all of this have some interesting science that we are solving. So which makes our students very excited about, about um, you know, the solutions they're going on. So in our lab, we are looking into trying to make sure we have very ultra low loss switches. Uh, things like there's a beautiful uh, metric we call, which is called the on resistance of a switch. That means how low resistance mm -hmm. can you offer? Can you give me a little tour of the types of application areas where you think these new technologies will be making the most impact? 
Correct. Um, yes, that's a great question for us. And uh, in the first part, we discussed a lot more about power and power electronics. So I'll focus on just another, uh, another technology that is established and emerging at the same time. So, you know, we are moving from 4G LTE to 5G and very soon before we know it, we will be talking about 6G or above, right? So um, this technology like gallium nitride is a really um, promising material for delivering high frequency. This is already uh, proved through you know, defense applications where this material is used in radar systems and uh, things like that. But in 5G, or I should say 5G plus, 5G and beyond, those applications, we are looking for very high frequency. You can connect frequency with speed. You can think about okay. higher the frequency, higher the speed, okay? And that uh, is an easy uh, sort of a concept as we know that 5G promises greater connectivity, ultra fast uh, connections or low latency, what we call, right? And also very reliable connections, okay? So all that needs this little transistors to be able to uh, operate at very high frequencies. How high? So current 5Gs are being discussed in the range of 28 gigahertz or to 40 gigahertz, okay? So okay. sub 40 gigahertz. If you're talking about 6G, we will be talking about 95 gigahertz. So okay. more than twice. Yeah, right. And so, so uh, are we talking about, are you do, doing a lot of the things with silicon currently? Yes, we are still looking into CMOS technologies to serve the 5G, but the improvement in what we call this operating frequency requires the transistors to be way more faster than that, okay? okay. And that cannot be done with silicon. And therefore we're looking into uh, gallium nitride and you know diamond has another interesting role which is in thermal management okay so we actually integrate in our lab gallium nitride and diamond to make this more uh, uh, power efficient at, at, at those frequencies so 5g will see a lot of uh, applications uh, in three fives or gallium nitride and so on but six and above will be impossible without this material so i think there will be a, there's a lot of ex excitement on that um, also, you know, uh, there are other examples like IOTs, uh, smart grid. IOT is the Internet of internet Things. Of so things, the, this is where our house is just filled with little internet devices. Our toaster is talking to our refrigerator and our computer is talking to our front door. This is the IOT. That's correct. And 5G actually um, promises what is what we call massive machine communication. That means all the smart things that you are dealing with, they're all connected. To the internet and they're talking to each other um, and so this material will play a role not only in the infrastructure or the setting up of this 5g network but also in the iot's because being efficient they can harvest right. energy right you so don't you don't want a toaster that's costing an arm and a leg to run because it has <laughs> right. a, a supercomputer inside of it that so, so the, it, it really needs to be negligible in terms of the cost of running whatever the appliance is. And certainly if the house is filled with them, you have to make sure that you're not uh, breaking the bank. That's correct. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> cost is, again, they're important, right? So we want to be power efficient at low cost. And okay. uh, again, these materials will play a very big role in that. Um, now, I know that you've done a little bit of work in biology, which is an area that I, I care, we all care about, but I, I do too. Um, what are the promises in biology as you see it? Yeah, that's a, a very, uh, I mean, not really a great question, but I would say a very timely one. So how we see that computation in the early decades, um, computation and electrical engineering, the two came together and made miracles. I think the next decade we'll see that in many other disciplines, particularly bio. Uh, so these materials are chemically inert and biocompatible. Okay, oh. a lot of tests are in, still in place because the you know as you know in biology, once you want to implement these things, we have to go through several hurdles. But um, in a nutshell, these materials, if you can, for example, if you can do a brain implant with this wireless technology where the form factor of the chip is tiny so that it can fit in the cell body of a neuron, for instance, right? Yes. So that changes the way brain mapping has been envisioned so far. Especially that, if it's not giving out the heat and all those things that you were talking about before. Because right now, an electrode, the problem about putting an electrode in my brain is it might fry my brain. But if you can come up with these more efficient, I could see that being a real game changer in terms of our ability to do implants. You nailed it. That's exactly the point. So 
basically, um, you know, even a one degree change in temperature is a lot, right, to yes. our body. So we want to try to see how we can reduce that loss that I was talking there about in terms of in the first part, the Joule's loss and all that, Joule heat and all that. So if we can reduce that loss, you can do this brain implant and think about putting thousands of these electrodes because it is reduced in form factor, high, more efficient, higher frequency. And at the same time, these materials don't add to more heat. You know, right. that, uh, so that's a, that can be a great game changer. So I'm very excited about bio-integrated electronics uh, for all these reasons. Yeah, that's very exciting. And of course, in addition to the brain, we have pacemakers and and uh, defibrillators for the heart, which currently are quite bulky. And you know, they sit under the skin. And you can imagine all of that getting more powerful, um, longer lasting. Is gallium in good abundance, or will that be a, a limiter to the whole uh, enterprise? Yes, that is in good abundance. Uh, so we okay. actually make gallium and combine it with nitrogen in a reactor, which we call. Uh, growth reactor, okay, <laughs> okay. not a nuclear reactor. So we do that and, and we can synthesize this material and it's pretty, pretty easy. Right now you can get like gallium nitride in eight inch uh, wafer size. Okay. So it's quite commercial already in terms of the material. Diamond right. is yet to see that maturity, but, and, um, but the, the thing, the interesting thing about diamond is the way we actually use methane, which you use for your, you know, gas, I mean, yes, your cooking yes. ovens, methane, right? Methane, methane, yes. yeah, methane gives you, so we strip the carbon out of the methane, which is, we often joke that that's a way we can reduce the carbon footprint as well. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. It's, it's, it's a very cheap way of making diamond. And this diamond is not the quality of the shiny right. stones as we were discussing. But nonetheless, yes, you don't have to go to Africa to get this diamond. What kind of team do you have to assemble to make all of this happen? Um, we really need a team that spans across multiple disciplines and also age, okay? I mean, right now, semiconducting, semiconductor technology is in its um, such an exciting stage that we attract a lot of undergrads, even starting from high schools, okay? There are people who are doing internship in my lab. They're excited about it, and we really want them to know how to build this thing. So that helps a lot when industry cares for it. And also multiple uh, discipline. I mean, the discussion has just begun. I mean, as I was giving the example of computation and electrical engineering, they're doing miracle when it comes to computers. We have to recreate that in bio, in chemical, in other, uh, you know, um, in sustainability, in uh, the problems that we're dealing with, starting from climate change to, um, you know, uh, improving the the life expectancy, for example, in human beings. All of this can be done with better connection to electronics. You've been listening to the Future of Everything podcast with Russ Altman. I want to remind you that the Future of Everything started out as a radio show on Sirius XM. So you'll hear references to that. Now it is a 100% podcast, but we still have access to the great shows that we taped with Sirius XM. There are more than 215 of them, and they cover an extraordinary range of topics. Please remember to subscribe or follow the podcast on your favorite listening app and definitely rate and review the podcast and tell your friends about it. It will help us spread the word. You can connect with me on Twitter at RB Altman and with Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.